On the phone, we have a gentleman who was a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame, a gentleman who worked for several franchises, won numerous Super Bowls, Hall of Famer Ron Wolf. Ron, I see that uh, you started out with the Los, or Oakland Raiders back in the early 60s. How did you end up getting started with them? What happened was uh, I had uh, finished taking my last final with at the University of Oklahoma, and the phone rang, and it was Al Davis. Uh, he had uh, just been named, uh, I think a month before, head coach and general manager of the Oakland Raiders. Uh, he mentioned he was looking for somebody in his uh, who could work in his talent department and would I be interested in coming out on a trial basis. And I said, certainly. And uh, I went out there, went to training camp with the Raiders, and from there I was hired uh, full-time. And it was a wonderful experience for me because at that time, being in the American Football League, there were there were eight teams, uh, 33 players, 264 players uh, total. And what Al would do, every night he would sit with his coaching staff, which consisted of four people, and they would study each position in the American Football League of the opponents. For example, all the offensive tackles, the guards, so on and so forth. So so you would have, one would have an opportunity to watch all the left tackles and then rate them one through eight. And, and listening to what, what a good player was versus a bad player and, and the theory that uh, a picture is worth a thousand words which in fact it is true, uh, really enabled me to get a uh, big insight into what it took to play professional football. And uh, that was kind of how he did things. He did things by comparison. So you're 24 years old. L. Davis hires you. Were you scouting both not only college and pro? I mean, you mentioned the pro side. Well, initially... Uh, Initially, it was basically pro. Uh, everything was done uh, from a pro perspective, and then we delved into the college thing well, the next year. Next year became college, so it became both. How many scouts were with the Raiders in 63? Two. So you have a lot of faith to put a 24-year-old on as one of two scouts. Well... Well, no, yeah, but he, he relied primarily on coaching staff was involved in this process as well. Uh, what happened was in those, in those days, the draft was in November. So the bulk of your scouting was done in the spring. That's when the whole, every, all the staffs went out, coaching staffs and everybody, the country was split up. They went out. And you could you could really get uh, a handle on who the good players were during spring practice because in those days in spring practice they really practiced. Uh, I mean they had scrimmages uh, and they were a lot looser then because there were no games coming up. It was about building their football team and a lot of information available to you, and it became it came down to uh, uh, the ability to pick the player. Uh, and then what would you you would do in the fall is just follow up like September, October, and the early part of November to make sure who, about injuries and things of that nature. The Raiders always seemed like they had great offensive line, and you had Hall of Famers Art Shell, Gene Upshaw, Jim Otto. Was the, did Al put an emphasis on getting offensive line to protect his quarterback? Well. Uh, and that's an interesting question. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know that's the only position in the game. If you don't have five, you can't play. If you don't, you could lose your receivers, you lose your tight end, lose your backs, you could lose your defensive linemen. I mean, but you can't if you don't have five offensive linemen, you can't play the game. So, uh, yeah, there was an emphasis on that. 
Yeah, it'd be a lot of fun being the AFL versus the NFL back then because, I mean, you were more of a passing league here. So, I mean, the other teams in the NFL were concentrating on running backs, whereas you guys could take these receivers and tell them, listen, you come in our league or with the Raiders and we'll be able to use you more. Yeah, it was a more wide open game, no question about it. More more single coverage in the American Football League then. I know a lot of people in the NFL uh, to this day still maintain that the NFL couldn't play defense. But, uh, you know, the, uh, the NFL did okay in Super Bowl three, Super Bowl four playing defense. So and then and then there was a merger. But be that as it may. It's, it's no different than the game today. I mean, if you if you have good players, you're going to be a good team, and there's no question about that. So the object is to get as many good players as you possibly can. And our whole basis with the Raiders was size and speed. So How, how hard was it going against the NFL, uh, recruiting players to sign with you guys instead of with the rival league? How hard was it? Yes. Well, it was difficult. I mean, it was very difficult because, uh, you know, initially, the first first couple of years, the, the AFL kind of did very well. And then what happened in 1965, Joe Namath signed with the Jets, and suddenly the American Football League, the whole image of the American Football League changed. Changed because of the money that, uh, Joe Namath was uh, was paid, and the image now of the American Football League was a lot different. Uh, it was difficult to that point, but it became a matter of just like college recruiting or recruiting in any sense. Once you were able to recruit, and the big recruiting tool was dollars, if you had more dollars than the other team, then the guy was going to sign with you. Is there a player that you think that you discovered that basically is your crowning uh, achievement with the Raiders? I know with the Packers, you traded for Brett Favre, but is there someone with the Raiders who kind of stood out? Yeah, he just went in the Hall of Fame uh, this past weekend, Stabler. And... Uh, I, I was involved with the uh, in the Daryl Monica acquisition, but I'd have to say Kenny Stabler was a big thing. What made Kenny so great? Well, he's a pinpoint passer. He's very accurate, uh, very smart. Uh, he was a terrific runner in college, but he got hurt in college, and and that was taken away. Hence, the nickname Snake was Ali was how he ran, but uh, he was just, we used to have practices where the ball never was on the ground. That's how accurate he was. And, uh, you know, he's, until Tom Brady did this year, He's a, he was the first quarterback ever to take his team to championship game in the Super Bowl era, five consecutive years. Uh, he was calm, cool, collected, Perfect demeanor for a quarterback, uh, and very, very talented. I know there's one player that loved Al Davis, who Al Davis wanted in the worst way was Lance Allworth. How many times did Al tell you you got to get me Lance? Well, no, he he never said that because he knew there was was any way he could ever get Lance. But I would have to think Lance was his favorite player. Yes. What was the transition like going from Al Davis as a coach to John Madden? Well, the team got better, uh, so it was, it was a big transformation. The better players, we had better players, and uh, John was a superb football coach, as was Al. But uh, you know, suddenly, as I said earlier, when you have really good football coaches, or really good football players, I'm sorry, really good football players, suddenly you're a lot better. You're a lot better off. And I think that's what happened here. Uh, John really had some uh, some quality quality teams and and quality players, uh, tremendous players. You just touched on a few of them yourself. Upshaw, Shell, 
they came in with, uh, uh, John came in in 66 and they followed. Uh, so Stapler came in in 68, although he didn't play 68, 69 and hardly played at all in 70. But I, I think that was a big difference. You mentioned Ken Stabers going to the Hall of Fame now, but you have two other quarterbacks who I think are deserving, and Daryl LaMonica and Jim Plunkett, guys who also got it done and won some championships. Exactly. Exactly. LaMonica, uh, LaMonica was a, a different, a different uh, time, and he was a tremendous long passer, perfect for what we were trying to do. Uh, and Plunkett, tough guy. Uh, won two Super Bowls as a quarterback with the uh, with the Raiders. Uh, I've been told that the problem with Plunkett getting in, uh, into the Hall of Fame is he didn't win enough games. So I don't know. I'm I'm not a big fellow with stats. So he won the big games though. The games that counted, he won. Yes, he did. What kind of gets me is they keep talking about Tony Dungy. Again, the first minority coach going in the Hall of Fame, things like that. But again, Tom Flores won two championships, was a great player. It seems like he doesn't get the respect he deserves. A lot of people say, well, he had the talent. Well, like you said, you need talent to win, but you still got to coach him. Exactly. You know, I, I, that's a shame that uh, – I think it's a shame that Tom Flores is not in the Hall of Fame because there are other people that are uh, – like, like he's 6-1 and one against Don Schuller, for example. He's uh, – I think an eleven and four versus Don Coriel. Don Coriel gets nominated all the time. Tom won two Super Bowls. Coriel never even won a championship. Uh, so I, I guess Tom has gotten lost in this this whole process, which is a shame uh, because he was a very very talented coach, a very good coach. As I said, won two Super Bowls as a head, as a head coach and. Uh, I mean, that that has to speak volumes. But he's overlooked for some reason. What convinced you to go to the Buccaneers in 75? The opportunity. Uh, the opportunity of the expansion team. I thought that I was ready to leave. I, I thought I could lead. Uh, once I got there, I discovered that, whoa, you know, I, I'm not as, uh, as smart as I thought I was, not as polished as I need to be. Uh, and uh, things just didn't work out. You had some pretty good drafts, so you got a guy in Leroy Selman who wasn't too shabby. No, he's probably still the best player they've ever had there. I know this in my career, 38 years. That's the best player I ever personally drafted, Leroy Selman. He was just a fabulous football player, and unfortunately for him, they played, uh, when I was there, the Bucks played a three-man front. If he had been in a four-man front defensive end, there's no telling what records he would have broken as a pass rusher. He was a superb football player. They do not come any better than Leroy Selman as a person and as a football player. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, he was on some bad teams. But again, they made the championship in 79 with the players you drafted with him and Doug Williams. Yeah, that's the only. you're right. That's the only true expansion team that ever did that. In four years, that expansion team played in the championship game. You had Paul Brown in expansion. You had Tex Ram, Tom Landry, all those guys. In ex- they didn't. They weren't able to do that. This Buccaneers, the Buccaneers were able to do that, and they were able to do that with 15 of the 22 players that I had a hand in getting there. So yeah, I'm very, very proud of that aspect of it. Were you the one who hired John McKay as coach? No, I was not. The owner did that. Did, so did he hire McKay before he hired you, or what was the uh, no. picking order? No, no, he hired me, and then and then he went and hired the coach. As uh, he hired the coach because uh, he had a very good friend who who strongly recommended him. He went with his uh, went with his friend. How did you feel at that time when he did that? Well. What do you mean, how did I feel? I mean, did you feel like he was kind of stepping on your toes, that you should have been the one hiring the coach? No, no, no. See, see, one of the things about working with Al Davis was it was always about the Raiders. Let's make the Raiders better. 
And that was kind of how I went into this thing. Let's make it a Buccaneers better. It's always about the Buccaneers. So somebody, I mean, how could you fault John McKay? He won four or five, I think four national championships. So, so, uh, I mean, I couldn't find anything wrong with that. But, no, I didn't have a problem with that. When you went to the Packers, did you realize that in order to be successful, you had to get a franchise quarterback to build around because you saw how important it was for the Raiders? Well, I saw how important it was for the Buccaneers. Yeah, I, I, I believe firmly that if you do not have a quarterback, you do not have a chance in the National Football League. So, yes, when I went to the Packers, I, had, I knew what I had to do. I had been through the experience in, uh, in Tampa, so I knew, knew all about that. I, I knew what I had to do in order to be successful uh, in Green Bay. And, you know, the chips kind of fell as they may for me. I was able to hire Mike Holmgren able to trade for Brett Favre, those two things turned that whole franchise around. Was Favre your first choice as a quarterback to acquire when you were with the Packers? Yes. Yes. He won my first, my first day on the job, official game, first game I ever went to as a, as a general manager, as executive vice president and general manager of the Green Bay Packers was in Atlanta versus the Falcons. Ken Hirock, whom I worked with at the uh, uh, Raiders for many years, was a was a person that ran the the Falcons football operation, and he told me up in the press box that if I wanted to see Brett Favre throw, I'd have to go down now before the team came out because when the team came out, he wouldn't be permitted to take any throws. So right away, I knew I had an opportunity to get this guy, and I started working on it at that point. And then finally, we got it done sometime, I think, in February. So there was a lot of negotiation to get Atlanta to give up on him or to trade him. Right. There was a lot. Was it hard getting players to go to Green Bay because just everybody thought it was kind of like the football Siberia until you got Reggie White to agree? Well, uh, I think the, the addition of Mike Holmgren coming in from San Francisco uh, kind of changed that a little bit. And then, and then the emergence of Brett Favre, uh, that, that helped. Plus, we started really doing a heck of a job, I, I thought, of selling Green Bay to, uh, throughout, the, throughout the league, about all the advantages uh, of being, uh, being a part of the Packers. Uh, I started a system where we would have honorary captains and captaincy of each team. Each game, we'd bring an honorary captain back. You think about all the great names and the lore of the Green Bay Packers football. It was a thrill to bring back, you know, Paul Horning, Ray Nisky, Willie Davis, Bart Starr, so on and so forth. So with the Packers, I mean, you mentioned bringing the guys in. You started winning. And then did it become a destination where people said, you know what, I want to play with you guys? I think so because we started, yeah, we started to win. Everybody likes to likes to be involved in winning. There's no question about that. Plus, you know, we have some great facilities out there. The important thing to remember here is that when you, the only thing we ever ask our guys to do would be for, conduct themselves properly and be a professional football player. That was all these guys were ever asked to do as members of the Green Bay Packers. We didn't have socials they had to go to, game, uh, society, uh, dinners, all that other stuff. This is all we ever ask our guys to do, and and they bought into it. And uh, you know, as a result, when I when I went there, and when I went with the Packers, the Packers had the poorest record in the National Football League with the advent of free agency. And when I left. The Packers had the best record in the National Football League. So I'm very, very proud of that. And they love Brett Favre to this day. I mean, I know they were upset at him for leaving for a while, but he's got that Green Bay mentality again. He looks like he comes from the woods. He embraces the fans. He's not a Hollywood-type guy, and I think that's the kind of people they like up there. They don't want the Hollywood stars. Well, he was a, he was a phenomenal player. And, you know, that everything that's up there, I mean – it's, I've said this before that 
And they say the old Yankee Stadium was the house that Ruth built. Well, that new Lambeau Field is obviously the house that Favre built. So, you know, it's changed a lot since you were there originally. Now people are getting married there. They're having conventions, all kinds of things. It's a <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. You mentioned the great players. There's one guy, another guy who should be in the Hall of Fame, Billy Houghton, all-time leading receiver, and he retired with the Packers. He can't even get a sniff of it. Yeah, yeah, they got they got a few of those guys. They got a guy like Bobby Dillon, who was just an incredible football player. Uh, they they got a few of those. Gail Gillingham, the guys up there told me, Gail Gillingham is the best guard ever to play. I'm talking about the old timers that. You know, football is very important up there. There's not much to do up there except ice fish and go to football games, but uh, go snowmobiling. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't try to get uh, the former Viking coach, Bud Grant, as your coach. It seems like all he loves to do is fish and hunt. <laughs> yeah. No, we. I think we did all right with our coaches, you know. You, you so. did a great job with hiring. How yeah. fulfilling was it winning that Super Bowl with Brett Favre? I'm sorry. Say that again. How fulfilling was it for you to get that Super Bowl in Green Bay? Oh, it was it was unbelievable. It was unbelievable because it, it just was just what you had said before that uh, the the thought process up there was that, that's football. So everybody was being threatened to be traded there. Or, you know, you keep us up, you're going to be we'll send you to the Packers. Well, suddenly it became a pretty good place to go play football. You know, we, we won 20 seconds, 25 straight games in Lambeau Field for a time, and that, it, it worked out very, very well for us. You did something that Vince Lombardi did back in the late 50s. Again, it was Siberia at that time. Vince made it a destination, and you did the same thing in the early 90s. Yeah, no, we, uh, yeah, no we did. We did that, and, you know, there's a lot of people that, uh, that made that happen, but... Uh, it was a great. You asked me about when that was a great thrill to to win that uh, win that title. Who was the leader of that team? Was it Reggie White or was it Brett? It's Brett. Brett on offense and Leroy Butler on defense. That and you know Reggie White played a played an enormous role. Don't um, don't misunderstand me, but yeah, Leroy Butler was the real leader of the defensive group. What made him so much of a leader? Did he just take control? He took control, yeah, yeah. Yep. You know, he there's might... a guy. There's a guy, you know, talk about safeties. I mean, he could cover. He, he could tackle and he could dog. So, perfect safety. What was your, what was your favorite moment in the NFL? My favorite moment moment in the NFL was uh, when the Green Bay Packers beat the uh, uh, Carolina Panthers for the right to go to the Super Bowl, and then we went. That's my that's the best moment I ever had because it happened in Lambeau Field, and again it was a place where everybody said this would never happen again. When free agency came to pro football, teams like Green Bay would die. Well, we won the title in Lambeau Field. And that was a big, big thrill to me. How did you feel when you found out you were going to go into the Pro Football Hall of Fame? That was, that was unbelievable. Uh, I mean, there are so many people that I'm deeply indebted to for their contribution to the fact that I am in the Hall of Fame. And to be recognized with those great names of the people that are legendary figures of the game. It's an awesome responsibility and an awesome feeling. 